Good morning. We begin today with general questions, and we start with question number one from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to improve online connectivity in town and city centres. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, this government is committed to driving technological and digital innovation to transform our economy. To do so, we need the right digital and connectivity infrastructure in place. So, in the coming year, we will seek to make Scotland the most attractive place in the UK to invest in telecoms. This will include delivering free Wi-Fi throughout major town and city centres, building on the £1 million we have already invested to provide Wi-Fi in public buildings across Scotland. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for his reply, or the Cabinet Secretary, should I say. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to delivering free Wi-Fi throughout city centres, particularly as not everyone in Stirling City Centre in my constituency currently benefits from this. But how will the Scottish Government help more businesses like those in Stirling to make better use of the digital infrastructure particularly now that the largest UK tech incubator company, Codebase, has established itself in Stirling, a very exciting development for a fabulous city. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Crawford makes a very good point that good connectivity leads to business investment, inward investment, and in Stirling. And it's also relevant to, to point out that in Stirling, thanks uh, to the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, presiding officer, the proportion, the percentage of premises of households and businesses that are able to access digital superfast broadband at speeds in excess of uh, on or in excess of 24 megabits per second has risen from 59% to 90%. In other words, uh, one third more people and businesses in Stirling have access to superfast bro uh, broadband as a direct result of the Scottish Government investment and programme. And I think that is solid progress on which we shall seek to build. And Finlay Carson. Uh, of course, welcome the announcement uh, for the Government's promise to deliver free Wi-Fi throughout major towns and city centres. Can the Minister provide some clarity on how this will be delivered and what constitutes a major town? For instance, will towns like Dumfries and Stranraer, my constituency, meet the criteria? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we will bring forward details of our commitment in the pro which was set out in the programme for government to deliver free Wi-Fi to major towns and cities across Scotland, and we will do so in due course. I think it's important to point out that we have already, as a direct result of uh, Scottish government investment, uh, provided uh, Wi-Fi access to a large number of libraries, community halls and sports centres, and also facilities for the most vulnerable in society, such as homeless hostels and residential care homes. And as a direct result of uh, our investment, 99% of Scotland's libraries now offer free public Wi-Fi, an excellent facility, and I'm grateful for the chance to publicize that. I'm also happy if Mr. Carson wants to write to me to consider any representations that he makes regarding any specific towns in his constituency very carefully indeed. Question number two, Pauline McNeill to ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to put specific provisions in the Social Security Scotland Bill to rule out private contractors conducting disability assessments. Minister Jean Freeman. We have made clear commitment to this Parliament and to the people of Scotland that private contractors will not be used to conduct disability assessments and I will deliver that commitment. But I want the member to know that I have looked at this issue in detail and my view is that a legislative ban is the wrong way to address the matter because it brings with it significant potential for other difficulties and unintended consequences to occur. I have offered the member some examples of that. I don't want to take up more time, presiding officer, but let me say that uh, my belief, like hers, is that this policy of not using private sector contractors is the right one uh, to take for Scotland and I want to make sure that a legislative ban doesn't inadvertently deflect from or compromise that delivery. As the member knows my door is always open and I'm very happy to discuss this further with her and to talk through the basis of my decision. Pauline McNeill. Uh, 
Presiding officer, um, I'd like to welcome the statement that Jean Freeman has consistently made on this important question about who should be allowed to uh, do the work of assessment in the social security system. Um, I'm sure she'll agree with me um, that there's very strong feeling amongst claimants who have had traumatic experiences dealing with private contractors. I fully appreciate that she's given it full consideration. What I would ask is how then can we ensure that in the future, in future governments, that if it's not on the face of the bill, that future governments will respect the implementation of a system which is a public system and not a private system? Minister. Thank you. I thank Ms McNeill for her support and for her additional question because it raises a matter that has come through over the summer and from many key stakeholders and that is the point about future proofing what we are doing here in terms of social security and I have to say that there is a limit to what we can do. We are setting the, through this legislation which will come to this parliament in due course for debate in this chamber as it is currently now in committee. Through this we are laying a robust framework for a rights-based social security system founded on the principles and so on of dignity, fairness and respect that I've already touched on. And we can in that set in statute some key elements of it. However, what we cannot do in that legislation is preclude future democratic decisions by people in Scotland and who they elect, who they send to this parliament and who becomes a future government. So there are limitations to future proofing that can be undertaken. But as I've said, I'm very content to talk further with the member and with others on this matter and on others around our uh, draft bill. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, Minister, uh, we met with the uh, you know, users, of, I hate to use the word users, I must admit, but we met with people from the Social Security, at the Social Security Committee this morning and we heard uh, evidence from the claimants that they were absolutely adamant that they did not want private uh, you know, contractors to deliver uh, the Social Security Bill and particularly in the assessments. But they did welcome the guidance which is in the bill and they were very supportive of that, which basically gives a bit of flexibility, as the Minister has already said, just in case there is a future government that doesn't look up, does not look upon the Social Security Bill as favourably as this government does with dignity and respect. I'm not sure there's a question there, but Minister, a very brief response. <laughs> well, perhaps, Presiding Officer, I can just use this opportunity to say a wee bit about how we do intend, or the work that we've begun on assessments. Minute, Minister, we have another question, so perhaps okay. you can respond to that one. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President. I'm a minister, may actually just have taken my uh, thunder almost there. So perhaps the question is, in regard to if we are going to move away, will the people that do the assessments be employed full time by Scottish Government? And if that is the case, where will we find physios, nurses, OTs to fulfil these roles? And um, in regard to that, what cost has the Scottish Government put on employing these people full time going forward. Minister. Excellent question. Thank you very much, Mr. Balfour. Um, can I just repeat that private companies um, with a necessary and understandable profit motive are incompatible with a rights-based social security system. So what we are doing, um, I appreciate fully that Mr. Balfour is not as old as I am. What we are doing is looking with experts led by the chair of the BMA GP group, who is a member of uh, the expert advisory group providing advice to me on uh, carers and disability benefits, that they are now working across the health and social care sector with uh, experienced colleagues to devise a system of assessments that will be evidence-based, fair, and most certainly fewer in number because we will get our decisions right first time without the need for these assessments. They're working that through for me because the best people to solve these issues are the people who know about it. And we will then use qualified, experienced professionals across health care uh, sectors and social care to provide assessments for us when they need to be undertaken, ensuring, unlike the current system, that the individuals who undertake an assessment are experienced and professionally qualified in the condition that the person presenting has. In other words, we will make sure that our system can deal with fluctuating conditions, with neurological conditions, with mental health, 
and will treat people with dignity, fairness and respect. And I am comfortable in a future uh, meeting with the Social Security Committee, I believe I'm there in November, to explain in further detail how those individuals who will not be employed full time by us, but will be bring that professional expertise from their daily health care and social care practice to benefit our rights-based social security system. Question number three, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to expand GP services in Lothian. Cabinet Secretary Shuna Robertson. The Scottish Government is aware of the pressures facing general practice and fully committed to supporting a model of sustainable general practice. I met with Lothian GPs last November to discuss how our significant national investment, £71.6 million for this year, can directly support general practice in Lothian. Investment this year, which will improve uh, GP recruitment and retention and expand the multidisciplinary primary care team as part of a commitment to see an additional £250 million invested annually, annually in direct support of general practice by the end of this parliament as part of a wider £500 million investment in primary care. Since the meeting, health and social care partnerships across Lothian are supporting practices to use their receptionist to signpost patients who don't need to see their GP to the right person, which is helping to take the strain off GPs. And through cluster working, GPs are able to identify areas for improvement and test solutions, such as enhancing their multidisciplinary teams. Miles Briggs. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that over 40% of GP practices within NHS Lothian are either full or not accepting new patients or restricting registrations? Does she agree with me that this is an indication of the crisis affecting GP services as they struggle, struggle to cope with demand? And with the RCGP predicting a shortfall now of 828 GPs across Scotland by 2021, does she really believe that the Scottish Government is doing enough to ensure that areas like Lothian with one of Scotland's fastest growing populations is going to have enough adequate numbers of GPs to actually cover this increase in patients? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, I'm aware of the, the challenges in Lothian, and as uh, the member will know, that's why I met with uh, Lothian GPs uh, to discuss uh, more closely some of their uh, particular issues. He will be aware, as I laid out in my initial answer, the investment that we're making uh, in primary care and in general practice specifically. Uh, there uh, is a, a lot happening within the expansion of the primary care workforce. Of course, not just increasing the number of GPs, but also other uh, multidisciplinary uh, team members. We have increased the recruitment and retention fund. We have specific initiatives such as the GP Development Fellow, which Lothian has taken advantage of. And what I can say to the member is that in terms of the GP specialty training recruitment, I can tell him that over 90% of the 1,082 Scottish GP training places are filled. Uh, so there is some progress being made. I absolutely accept there is more to be done, which is why we're working very hard with the BMA to deliver a new GMS contract that I think will help to transform primary care. Neil Findlay. I wish the Cabinet Secretary would stop talking in euphemisms. We don't have challenges. We have a crisis in general practice. Over the summer, I held a drop-in session for GPs in West Lothian. They told me of a staffing crisis, the complete reliance on extremely scarce and expensive locum cover, and practices a resignation or sickness absence from collapse. All practices in Mid Lothian have closed lists. What a damning indictment of this government's failure to plan for general practice. So will the minister apologise for GPs, to GPs and their patients for this crisis and tell us what's happening now to resolve it, not in some time in the future. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Neil Finlay, what's happening now is a £71.6 million investment this year, directly supporting general practice, not just in Lothian, but elsewhere across this country. What is happening now is a negotiation of a brand new GMS contract that will transform primary care. And the importance of that is we need to make general practice more attractive as a career, and the new contract will help to do that. And what ha is happening now is 90% of the specialty GP training places is being filled because of the efforts being made to promote general practice. So a lot of action being taken in the here and now to support general practice that will make a real difference in the here and now in Neil Finlay's area and elsewhere in Scotland.
Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to local festivals. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, Scotland's local festivals are in the main supported locally by their local authorities. The Scottish Government provides support through the national funding bodies Creative Scotland and Events Scotland. Uh, Creative Scotland supports festivals that apply, apply directly to it for funding, while Events Scotland supports a portfolio of events through its national, international and signature programmes designed to assist event organisers grow their audience. And support is also available through themed year funding, which in 2017 links inspirational events with the year of history, heritage and archaeology. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And 2019 marks the bicentenary of the death of the great Enlightenment inventor James Watt. And I propose that a week-long James Watt festival should take place in Inverclyde, the place of James Watt's birth, and that would celebrate the legacy of the great inventor. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this festival could play an important role in re-establishing Scotland's place internationally as innovators, thinkers and cultural leaders, and would also have the positive impact upon Inverclyde, the teaching of STEM subjects, wider society, the economy and culture? Cabinet Secretary. Indeed, uh, events planned to celebrate the life and achievements of James Watt would be warmly welcomed across Scotland, particularly for the reasons that the, the member outlines, and particularly by the community in Inverclyde. So we're very happy to consider approaches, as uh, would Creative Scotland and their Open Fund in particular. But of course, on the 23rd of August, the Scottish Government announced £250,000 for annual science festivals, precisely because the inspiration that young people particularly can have in the STEM subjects uh, can be told through those festivals and I think celebrating the great James Watt is one of the ways that could uh, enhance that programme in 2019. Question number five, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has regarding the provision by local authorities of parking sites that are suitable for gypsies and travellers. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The provision of gypsy traveller sites is a matter for the relevant local authority and Scottish Government does not routinely collect information concerning sites in Scotland. All Scottish local authorities must, by law, produce a local housing strategy that sets out their priorities and plans for delivering housing and related services. These strategies should include plans for meeting any gypsy traveller housing needs, including addressing any requirement for the provision of suitable sites. Stuart Stevenson. Noting the particular difficulties in Murray, where Tory part-time MP Douglas Ross was recently a member of the council administration that has failed to provide any such parking sites, does the minister believe that rather than vilifying travellers who make a valuable contribution to society, as a top priority problem, as he described it, Mr. Ross and others in his party should work to address that deficiency. Minister. Minister. Yes, I do agree uh, with Mr. Stevenson. As I set out in my first answer, the provision of suitable gypsy traveller sites in Murray is a matter for the Murray Council based on their lo local housing strategy. Councillors should look at the needs highlighted in their local housing strategy and address the issue accordingly. Uh, gypsy traveller communities are among the most disenfranchised and dis discriminated against in Scotland. The Scottish Government values the gypsy traveller community, the contribution they make and the important role they play in enriching Scotland socially, culturally and economically. And we are committed to tackling all forms of discrimination and promoting a multicultural society based on mutual trust, respect and understanding. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making to ensure that the voluntary sector groups are treated as equal partners in the development of integrated health and social care. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Scottish Government promotes and values the contribution which the voluntary sector and other third sector organisations make to the integration of health and social care. Integration authorities must involve the third sector in the strategic commissioning and locality planning process and a third sector representative is required to be a member of the integration joint board. IJBs also have the flexibility to include nominations such as a representative from the voluntary sector. However, this will vary due to local circumstances. 
Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but it's not addressing some of the needs and concerns of the voluntary sector that I represent in South Scotland. I've been involved on a voluntary basis with the third sector and know about the fragility and challenges before becoming an MSP. Healthy Valleys in Lanark and Borders Care Voice in Gala Shields have both expressed concerns to me about funding security and continuity, about training opportunities and about status recognition, most importantly of all. What can the Cabinet Secretary do to reassure these groups and groups across South Scotland and widely, more widely in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, first of all, if Claudia Beamish wants to write to me with some of the specific concerns that those local organisations have, I'd be happy to look into them in more detail. What I can tell her is that the Scottish Government has established and supported a network of third sector interfaces to support uh, and uh, fund third sector organisations at a local level. So funding of uh, over £12 million uh, was provided to 32 third sector interfaces covering each local authority across Scotland. And I would have thought organisations in her area would have benefited from that. But if she wants to write to me, I'm happy to uh, look into them.